Today we're talking about empire, specifically the current existing empire. Are you part of an empire? Yes, you are. So you better learn about it, huh? I think most people think empires are, and imperialism are really just a thing of the past. Other people would argue that the U.S. is the empire. There are some arguments for both, sure. But the way I see it, the U.S. is one part of a much bigger empire. Empire is, of course, a huge topic, so all I'm trying to do in this video is give you some idea what the modern empire is and how it works so that you can see it for yourself. Empire today doesn't come from one country or continent. It's an empire of laws, corporations, and police that blanket the world like a patchwork quilt, different on the surface, but all part of a single entity. Except this quilt is almost impossible to escape from. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. Over time, we've used different words to describe political units like empire, kingdom, nation, state, republic, liberal democracy, but it's not certain where one ends and the other begins. It's more of a question of which words go in and out of fashion. For example, nowadays we have nation states, right? But what happened to empires? They just all disappear? Russia and China aren't empires? <laughs> Not anymore. Now, there are no empires, only nation states. And what happened to colonies? No more colonies? Canada and Australia aren't colonies? Not anymore. Now, there are no colonies, only nation states, plus a few territories like Puerto Rico, known today as protectorates. If the U.S. has protectorates, it's an empire, right? Again, arguments both ways. Think about a historical empire. They conquer and expand as much as they can around a capital, rising and eventually falling, trading, plundering, colonizing, which basically means enslaving and imposing a new language and way of life on the locals, formalizing their rule over time through religion, nationalism, school, or all three. Does that kind of empire still exist? In some ways, yeah. Invading Iraq, installing a new state, and selling its oil fields to big oil firms? Sounds like imperialist behavior. Camping out in Afghanistan for 20 years might qualify. Justifications for today's wars are quite similar, too. Bringing peace and freedom to backward people, educating and civilizing the barbarians by different names, freeing brown women from brown men. But there are some differences, too. When I talk about empire, I'm referring to the entire global political economic system. Because that's how I think we should be thinking of it, as a kind of empire, and this video is to explain why I think that. This system is very much a product of older empires working in their own interests, and it still works today for the most powerful people in the system. But it doesn't operate quite the same way as the old empires. For example, there's no question of annexing new territory. The interstate system wouldn't allow it. Since Woodrow Wilson in 1919, so-called self-determination has been the basis of state legitimacy. So instead of annexing territory, when some big corporation wants to expand even more, a number of governments invade or support a coup somewhere and then install a new government. This one formally democratic and more amenable to international trade agreements and opening up markets and inviting in foreign troops than the last one was. 
This way, the interstate system doesn't have to break down, but people with power can still do whatever they want. Today's imperialist military ventures are likely to take the form of a multilateral coalition. It gives the operation an air of being what everyone wanted the whole time. For example, to gain support for both of the U.S.-led invasions of Iraq, that's 1991 and 2003, the U.S. government attempted to go through multilateral institutions like the U.N. Security Council. The U.S. was just the main military force of what was initially at least a broad coalition of friendly states. They weren't all European. In 91, the coalition included Saudi, Egypt, and Syria. In 2003, well, take a look at the makeup of that invasion force. So, let's see here. List of countries in the coalition. Pretty big list, I think you'll say. So, you've got the US, UK, Australia. They were like the main forces, plus Poland and Spain. A couple of other places, yeah, they're European, true, but let's let's look a little further. Some of these are harder to understand, you know, without a lot of context. El Salvador sent at least 380 troops. Estonia sent 40. Moldova sent 24. Okay. South Korea sent 3,600 troops. Did you even hear of their presence in Iraq? Tonga sent 55 troops. Okay. <laughs> Bosnia and Herzegovina sent 85 troops. I thought I thought there were peacekeepers there to stop a war there. When did that end? <laughs> Kazakhstan sent 29 troops. Mongolia sent 180 or more, I don't know. It says peak of 180. We've got these other countries, again, still hard to understand why. Italy sent 3,200, quite a bit. Um, Norway sent 150, Japan sent 600, Thailand sent over 400 troops, the Philippines sent more than 50 troops, both for a year each. And, and tell me, what, what the hell is this? What is this? Iceland, two troops? What is going on? Assuming these figures are correct, look how many different states deployed troops to Iraq. Why do they even bother? In some cases, you know, 50 here, 2 there. I don't know in individual cases, but they must have got some kind of benefit from it. I don't mean the country, by the way. I mean the people who gave the orders. More to the point, this is just how the Empire operates nowadays. If you want to take a huge bribe for integrating the people you rule into the global market, you might also need to send a few hundred of them to point guns at people for a year or two. In both wars, most of the other states eventually withdrew from the coalition and left the U.S. holding the bag, but then that was probably the intention in the first place. As long as they support it at first, the empire has its legitimacy. The political influencers and speech makers get rewarded for their support of the goals of the system, and they get to tell their subjects they were actually opposed to the war the whole time, when it's too late to matter. So that's the recent past. You might have noticed we don't hear so much about the U.S. at war nowadays. It's still killing people, but its actions are mostly confined to police actions and bombings. They're not launching major invasions. They're mostly supporting local forces fighting against rebels. They're also enforcing sanctions on states like Iran and North Korea, and they're also guarding shipping routes against pirates. Now, it's not like everyone's equal under this empire just because it's global. Location still matters a lot. There's no doubt some places are net beneficiaries of cross-border capital flows. The benefits mostly go to the owners of capital, but some of them trickle down to the workers in places like North America and Europe, plus nowadays, of course, other places like Japan and South Korea. And that's why they have higher living standards and more opportunities than their counterparts in other countries. Plus, white supremacy, of course, means people living under those states who are closer to whiteness will get trickled on 
a little more. This system has made business so easy, creating wealth and poverty is just a question of choosing a place on the map to take money from. And almost all states serve this system. Most states are actually pretty similarly structured nowadays. They have most of the same functions and some variation in how efficiently they carry them out and how much money gets lost in the process. Some of the most important laws are the same in most countries, uniform, like laws regulating trade and foreign investment. I'll go into that in a minute. The U.S. military is the right arm of this empire, with something like a thousand military bases and installations and airstrips and CIA black sites all around the world. Wherever some ruler the empire likes says there are some terrorists and insurgents, the U.S. or another state or a private military contractor can help out with training or bombs or boots on the ground. When I lived in Egypt, the U.S. was sending the government huge shipments of tear gas to use on my friends. A few years later, Egypt was bombing Libya. David Cameron, who was Prime Minister of the UK at the time, took photos of himself with protesters in Tahrir Square in Cairo, and then proceeded to tour the Gulf states with a bunch of British arm dealers. When we talked about the coalitions to invade Iraq, we got a glimpse of how many different governments send military assistance of various sorts. So while the US is integral, it's not alone. And it's not just military. US police are trained in Israel. They're trained in the same usual anti-terror tactical shit that the IDF learn. They're trained to kneel on people's necks. Really, they're kneeling on the necks of whole communities. After all, the colonial system in Israel is similar to that in the US. So one reason there are fewer large-scale cross-border invasions nowadays is the, US, the, the empire has already spread everywhere. It's on land, it's in the sky, it's on the water, it's under the water. It's in space, just in case you wanted to leave. It's in Hollywood movies. It's here on YouTube. It's in your phone, just in case you wanted to text something illegal. It, you know, states, they still jockey for influence, but they still have to follow the basic rules. So putting your hopes into one or another state in the interstate system to save us from the interstate system is a dead end. It's just another way to say, change it from the inside. This global scale military cooperation illustrates another big difference between the old imperialism and the new. Today, there is no capital city. The empire has no center, no city at the root of our trouble that we could destroy like Ra's al Ghul thought. No giant machine we could just pull the plug out of. Not all decisions are made in the US or Washington or Wall Street. Is Wall Street much more influential than, say, Dubai? In other words, do the people with all the money in New York have all the power, as opposed to the people with all the money in the UAE? It's possible there is a sociologist out there trying to measure the relative difference in how influential individual rich folk are in each place, but it's moot. The point is, the richest people on Wall Street and the richest people in Dubai both have the ear of people in politics, whether in the US or almost everywhere else. Governments don't have to do what they want, but why wouldn't they? They get rewarded if they do and punished if they don't. Wall Street and Dubai are two of a hundred places you might think of as hubs of power. Power in this global system, this new empire, is dispersed. 
There's no geographical center, and there's no human center either, because there's no triumvirate making all the decisions, no secret committee you could just throw in jail, no shadowy cabal that if you just identified them, you'd be able to stop them. It's millions of people. But more to the point, it's their seats. People get their power from where they sit, or from their access to people in seats. Power comes from many different seats nowadays. It comes from governments, but also from corporations, lobby groups, rich individuals, NGOs, IGOs like the UN, and some of these are obviously more influential than others. This network of institutions represents a global class solidarity among the world's richest people. It's that conspiracy you were looking for. None of the institutions or the people who run them are at the top, though, because capital is at the top. By capital, I mean the means of production, the businesses, the offices, the machines, the land, and all the other assets people use to accumulate money. Everything defers to capital. Look at Bernie Madoff. Even rich people will go to jail if they make the money mad. The logic of the new empire doesn't require it to invade and annex new territory on behalf of a ruler. Instead, it creates political conditions that make it easy for huge corporations to enter the market and do business smoothly and almost impossible for governments to stop them. This way, the empire of capital can keep expanding. From an article you can find in the description, capitalists enjoy international legal protections, such as the World Bank and IMF's legal immunity under U.S. law, and even more egregiously, under the Investor State Dispute Settlement Mechanism, which enables investors to sue governments for intervening in their profiteering, rather than the other way around. For example, when an Enron Bechtel GE electricity plant was shut down in India due to concerns about human rights violations, nine lawsuits were launched against India by the companies involved citing lost profits caused by the closure. Surprise, surprise, the companies won $160 million in compensation. If you've heard of neoliberalism, you probably know about how governments have for a while been trying to cut spending in anything that might help people or hinder the market, like welfare or employee protections. So that in theory, those governments can pay off their debts. Which in practice, of course, would never happen because when they cut welfare programs, they just spend the windfall satisfying some lobby group. The modern empire imposes conformity at the fundamental level and allows diversity on the superficial level. It's all for locals celebrating their traditions, just as long as they do it within the framework of the nation state, the corporation, markets, and international law. Despite global white supremacy, yes, it is global, the empire requires enough people of color in the top seats to make it look like it's a universal system based on universal values rather than one that came out of Europe and exists to serve the wealthy. The empire thrives on diversity because it wants the local colonized population to think the empire is good for everyone, not just white people. We're an equal opportunity empire. And yet, despite all this superficial diversity, borders are an integral part of this empire carefully controlling the movement of people and responsible for huge amounts of violence. Those of us who want to fight this empire are in a tough spot. How do you rebel when there's no clear target to rebel against? The enemy is global, so our resistance needs to be global. It'll take a lot of effort by activists working all over the world. Some people have called for more democracy and transparency in imperial institutions, but I think we should be trying to eliminate those institutions altogether. 
and build new ones in their place. They've the, the existing institutions have never existed to do what the multitude want, and I don't see any reason to think they could be changed. We should be disrupting whatever imperialist activity takes place near us, while facilitating however we can the flow of people and cooperation and ideas across borders. Indigenous people around the world have always done the most to fight imperialism, and unsurprisingly, they're the targets of many of the governments of the empire. Those of us who oppose colonization and war need to oppose the state and the corporation. The U.S. makes war on behalf of this global system, but if the U.S. didn't, it's pretty likely other states would pick up the slack. All the strongest states benefit, if not from each war, at least from the interstate system, the empire itself, which requires violence every day to keep it in place. The ultimate goal of this system is the accumulation of wealth and power. Our goal and guiding principle should be the complete decentralization of wealth and power. Thanks.